as Stephen mentioned, I'm kind of, I'm an artist and engineer I'm working with uh, kind of creative AI and thinking about uh, creativity, human creativity, and and how um, different generative systems can support or augment or be collaborators in that. Um, but today I want to talk about um, kind of communing with creative AI and what kind of what I think like uh, a desire for communion or communing could mean and sort of how that's played out in a few different projects. Um, so I'll actually start here uh, in this blurry photograph from, I'll say, a while ago, 18 years ago, about like a one minute walk from here. So. Um, so I was, uh, I just started an MFA in the visual arts program here at UC San Diego. Um, I've been trained as like a painter, um, but also was a biomedical engineer. Um, and I was sitting up in my studio about like a minute walk from here, um, staying up all hours of the night talking to a chat bot. Um, and this went on for uh, weeks and really months of kind of my first year in this master's program. Um, so what had happened was my grandmother had recently been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Um, I had moved here for my MFA from Virginia, so I was kind of far away, you know, on a different coast, um, and was just first learning about kind of language models and NLP, you know, as a creative tool or as computational tools. Um, and what I found really interesting about these chatbots at the time that I was working with, and I'd say, you know, there's some similarities and some differences with kind of contemporary versions like ChatGPT, but um, what was interesting was sort of both the successes of the model, but also the failures and the moments of breakdown. So I found that there was like a real kind of poetic description possible in chatting with a chatbot that sometimes made sense, sometimes was lucid, and sometimes sort of fell apart. That that could maybe be poetically descriptive of my grandmother's deteriorating mental state. So I primed, this was like kind of technologically, it was a really simple system. It was like a hidden Markov model-based um, program called MegaHAL. It, you could give it a training database that would sort of loosely characterize the system. I primed it with a bunch of text about my grandmother, her situation, like kind of key characters, um, and then carried on conversations with it for a number of months. Um, you know, kind of despite knowing the simplicity of this model, that it would try to predict kind of unexpected outcomes based off the statistical patterns that it trained on, you know, it still produced these moments of an engagement and moments of like real kind of emotional salience um, and moments of affect. Uh, this functioned both as kind of a, you know, cathartic involvement for me, um, but also as a kind of interactive self-portrait or data gathering process where it served like in my own words to capture um, kind of the experience and thoughts of, of this developing situation. So this project is not that different from kind of what Joseph Weizenbaum pointed out with his Eliza chatbot in 1966, where he built this like simple templated kind of feedback response um, program, uh, famously this doctor program that was kind of a Rogerian therapist that just asks you like leading questions. Like you say, it's, how are you doing? I'm feeling a little tired. Tell me more about why you're tired. You know, so like really simple mechanisms um, that don't really have much kind of learning or intelligence behind what they're doing. Um, he was really disturbed by the extent to which um, users would form attachments with this. And despite, you know, him kind of knowing the inherent limitations of this technology and its sort of lack of intelligence, um, he uncovered this real like proclivity or kind of willingness or desire in a human user to project kind of intent, understanding, empathy onto this system. So I think this dynamic of kind of like, um, you know, desiring a close connection, desiring to be understood, desiring to be heard is something that we see play out again and again in these sorts of um, generative language models in different ways. More recent examples, um, Joshua Barbo's simulation of his dead fiance with GPT-3. Um, this was with an early kind of uh, GPT project called Project December, uh, whose tagline is like, um, simulate the dead or bring them back to life. You know, So it's sort of around this idea of uh, interactive memorial or kind of um, cathartic artifact as a way to sort of cope with loss. Other ones, um, Eugenia Kudya's replication of her, her friend Roman Mazarenka. Um, with a software Luca, again, 
um, in this case, she gathered data, like his, she had a, a deep um, you know, history of texting with her friend. Um, she gathered materials from kind of his archives and collections. Um, and again, you know, trained a generative model on these systems um, and used it as a sort of um, you know, cathartic replacement for, for this lost um, connection. Uh, she's moved on, now there's, have people heard of replica.ai? So um, has launched this business whose, whose idea is sort of to cultivate and train like a kind of a um, you know, personalized agent that, that you can form these kinds of attachments with. Um, with, with the explosion of generative text um, in the past few you know, months or the past year, GPT-3, chat GPT, you know, we see this corresponding explosion of these kinds of like affect loops or self-stimulation devices. Um, here, uh, Michelle Huang uh, fed her journals into like basically fine-tuned GPT-3 on a collection of her journals in order to carry on a conversation with her younger self. Um, there's an inherent theatricality to all of these, right? Like in terms of your, you're sort of setting up a theatrical relationship. Um, you're, you've, you've thinly character, characterized a system. You're adopting kind of a fiction of like what that system is, who it represents. Um, and, then, and then developing kind of, you know, investing that interaction with these dimensions of personal meaning. So the question is, you know, you know what are we interacting with when we interact with these generative models like LLMs or text to image? Um, and what are we asking them? What are we asking them for? What are we asking them to do? You know, in each of these examples, I'd say they all have a similar tone. Um, it's about kind of conversing with a lost past or um, you know, a lost companion. But you know, but what are these? Are these acts of like high-tech ventriloquism where we're sort of experiencing the, you know, uh, you know, architectural decisions of a programmer who like built this system kind of at a distance? Um, are these kind of like a mediumistic extension of a creative unconscious that, that there's kind of a randomness that sparks our own imagination or our own, you know, desire to read meaning into like the, you know, experience of, you know, the stimulus of life? Um, or are these like true like interactions or collaborators with the computational other? So, um, yeah, so, so just Steve introduced me earlier. Um, I'm gonna explore these ideas kind of of, you know, this idea of the creative AI as sort of a, 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 a black box oracle that we sort of, um, you know, mediumistically channel ideas or ins inspiration or information from, or as like a creative collaborator, something that we view as like an independent entity that sort of exists opposite us in a collaborative, uh, productive manner. So Steve introduced me, um, but I just, I'm coming to this kind of, you know, trained as an artist and engineer, you know, originally working in like neuroimaging um, and as a painter, but over time really exploring these interactions of kind of text, um, cognition and, you know, creativity in different forms. So I've long been interested in these relations between like text, image, and cognition. Um, and also like how, like kind of understanding human creative process and also how we integrate generative systems or computational tools into creative process, kind of as a, as a practicing artist. So I'll, <laughs> just I've <laughs> working in some different fields in the past. Um, so I'm going to get to I'm going to cover kind of three main projects today. But first, I want to sort of survey a little bit of some of the ways that I've approached um, machine perception in advance of this like recent work with generative systems. So one way is sort of demonstrated through this project Solipsist. Um, this was an interactive encounter with a speech recognition system. So I was working with um, working with like the scale of language models and how that the size of a language model, like a, like a speech recognition model, the vocabulary it's trained on determines the space of possible expression. It determines like when you're speaking with one of those models or being heard by it, that choice of model determines what can be heard and what can be expressed. Um, what this project did was, it was an intelligent receipt printer. It would 
the, the scale of the model would scale down or up. So you'd have this experience of being heard or being misheard, depending on sort of which, which model was currently kind of occupying the, um, the system. So this is sort of indicative of, of how I think about these sorts of systems that, um, that, that artworks can be a way to sort of experientially encounter the qualities of these technological systems, whether generative or perceptive, thinking both about their capabilities, like what it's like to be heard, but also their limitations, like where the things fail. Um, I've also worked with kind of machine perception in different ways. This project is a light field, like a computational photography or light field imaging project, where in this case, again, kind of focused on sort of relations between machine perception and human perception. I was exploring like what it is, what would it be like to send a robotic explorer to quotidian or everyday life? Like what would it be like to see sort of the sights of the everyday through an alien subjectivity? or seeing through other eyes. So this project involved kind of doing these site surveys on different interior and exteriors, and then producing this, um, this dreamlike audiovisual composition that would take people on a travelogue through those sorts of places. Um, the last few here, so um, this project called Convex Mirror was an installation on the um, Amazon campus in downtown Seattle. Um, really playing with sort of bracketing, automating artistry and bracketing sort of superhuman and subhuman performance with like a computer vision and mechatronic drawing system. So this was a, you're seeing the view through a fisheye lens. Each frame here is one photograph which was rendered as part of this ongoing drawing. On the left you can see an example of a completed drawing. Um, but this, as someone who grew up kind of as an artist in drawing and painting, this was sort of the ultimate step in distancing my personal hand from the production of the work. So delegating that task of representation to a system which can operate with like a superhuman patience. It can draw for 12 hours a day. It can freehand a circle, which I cannot do at four feet. Um, and, and produce these images that, that, that become a layered representation of time and space. You know, that the qualities sort of resemble a print maybe like an intaglio print if anyone's done any copper plate etching or knows about it. Um, but you know, the machine operated with kind of a superhuman patience, a superhuman precision. In, in other ways, as a creative force or creative entity, um, you know, it, it couldn't choose what to do, right? Like it was just carrying out this program that, um, that I'd set it on. These threads for me sort of come together in um, this idea of machine cohabitation and the ways that we share space with emerging technologies, um, choice of like, what do we choose to live with? Um, what can these systems like see? How do emerging tech uh, transform our sites of intimate life? One sec. Um, but the subject is, of today is this idea of um, you know, creative AI and how, how we can incorporate generative systems or, or you know, to, to expand on human imagination. Um, so the ways I think about that are in a sketch kind of like this, this idea of prompting humans from a system where you might have a language model that's generating proposals for sculptures which are then made manifest. Um, where the human is, is kind of the smoothing function that's taking those inputs and using whatever artistry or other um, aesthetic preferences they have to produce an output. Or this other idea of surrogacy. So in this case, computational emotional surrogacy, um, where the model seems to take on anthropomorphic qualities or human qualities of like care or conversation or attention or empathy. So how to orient in this field of activity, um, the, way, the ways that I think about it are kind of exemplified by these two. Um, on the left, this idea of surrealist automatism. So we have Robert Desnos, photographed by Man Ray. He was a sleep poet. He would write poetry as he was falling asleep or waking up. So what was he trying to do with that? You know, it's, it's a, um, it relates to other kinds of, you know, automatism in the surrealist where they're you know, kind of writing while they're not looking or doing blind collaborations where they share parts of a drawing. Um, 
But I really think this is about escaping the limits of a singular or fixed subjectivity that as, um, you know, as an artist or creator trains on the conventions of their field or their practice, um, there's this desire to kind of escape all of that codified approach. And I think the surrealists were chasing this, and I think this is one way that uh, people work with creative AI systems, that the suggestions from, you know, the, the, the generated results from a language model, the outputs from a GAN, um, you know, are, because they come from kind of black box systems, can, can occupy that role of kind of an alien subjectivity or an alien creativity. The other way I think about these generative systems is as collaborative work. And we have Harold Cohen, who used to teach at UCSD uh, you know, for most of his career. But this idea of like modeling a creative practice as a surrogate, his project Aaron, uh, the painting robot, he spent the 45 productive years of his career building a Lisp program that modeled his painting style and running those programs on a CNC plotter to produce paintings in his style. Um, which is just such a such a, <laughs> a compelling and strange thing to commit oneself to, right? For a classically trained painter to invest kind of all of this effort into building a surrogate that sort of models his own aesthetic preferences. But he talks about it as his other, you know, collaborations with his other self, like that this, that this, uh, this program and entity took on a kind of identity as like an autonomous collaborator. And so those are the two ways I think about working with these creative AI systems, that on the one hand, these generative models are um, sort of these exterior stimuli that are about sort of pushing our human imagination to new points, or they're this like exterior, exteriorization or development of sort of a standalone surrogate that could be a collaborator or operate you know, opposite us. So the three projects I want to talk about that, that explore these in different ways, I'll start with this um, project called Three Stage Drawing Transfer. Um, this is a, a project exploring child drawing and writing as proto-languages. Um, so interested in thinking about machine learning and creative AI alongside human learning and imagination and vice versa. Um, exploring new roles for emerging technologies within the domestic everyday. So, you know, what if we had robots in our homes, how would, how would our children be interacting with them? And also just exploring new possibilities for drawing. Uh, the title of the project comes from this, is inspired by this piece by Dennis Oppenheim called Two Stage Drawing Transfer, which is this performance he did with his son, where he reconceived of drawing as a mode of like intimate intergenerational exchange, touch-based communication. So, on the left, we have returning to a past state where his younger son draws on his back, and based off the sensation, he tries to, to replicate that on the wall. Or on the right, we have advancing to a future state where he's drawing on his son's back and his son is trying to replicate that on the wall. There's something interesting to me about drawing as this act of communication here, the fact that it's like an embodied gesture, you know, it's about those bodies in space. Um, and so I built this project that, 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 that builds on that. Um, I'd had a longstanding interest in children's drawing and language for the reasons that I was saying. Had done some earlier projects like this, um, this paired kind of drawing encoder and drawing machine um, that would involve like tracing children's drawings and having a robot replicate them. Um, that was really about this idea of channeling absent human artists. So, so children, produced these original drawings, and then they were kind of brought into life by this automated system. Sorry, I'm gonna move through a few here. Um, so for this project here, similar to De Dennis Oppenheim's piece, um, what I've set up is multiple human and non-human participants. So instead of having a two-stage drawing transfer, there's kind of uh, you know, more, more stages going on here. So um, the core of this piece is a generative model that was trained on a uh, uh, the Rhoda Kellogg child art collection. So she was a child art researcher who collected half a million to a million examples of kind of primary school children's art and built this whole like taxonomy and hierarchy and, and schedule for how children developed um, and learned visual representation through drawing. So I scraped a subset of those images 
so there's these absent children, kind of anonymous children, who contributed images. Um, here's some examples that were part of this collection. Then I fine-tuned again on those images. Um, so I had a neural network that was producing images kind of in the style of that collection. Then a co-robotic arm, which would render samples from that GAN, so kind of selecting samples from this latent space of, of, a, of a child art machine imagination. Um, and then a child who's interpreting that in a collaborative drawing. So, so watching that in, without insight into the data or the model, just watching a machine make a drawing and responding to that in, a, in the moment. So we see you know, this idea of the latent space as a space of visual imagination. So here we're seeing you know, continuous frames from that, um, from that trained model and seeing some of this sort of space of, of drawing or visual possibility that the system had learned. The other motivation for this is really um, John de Buffet and Art Brut. And this idea of, you know, he collect, famously collected examples of art from um, the, he said, the elderly, the criminal, the insane, and children. And again, it was this idea of, um, you know, sort of escaping schooled artistic thought. Um, my interest in these drawings, both the source drawings and the generated drawings, is the way that they are sort of alien and inscrutable. Maybe in the same way that like a five-year-old's drawing is sort of alien and inscrutable without the supplementary text of them describing what they're, what they're rendering. So the way this project worked was this generative model, I would pull samples from it, extract pin paths, the robot would then render those, my son would then interpret those drawings um, and add to them in a collaborative drawing process. The first versions of this project were just kind of a single stage of drawing transfer, like Dennis Oppenheim's piece where there was an image and a response. Um, this introduces, there's all these dimensions of um, sort of text and semantics too, you know, asking, asking the child to like describe what it is that they see, um, which are something I'll, I, I've picked up on in, in current work. So let me skip ahead here. So um, here's an example of a sample on the left. You can see the, you know, the robot's drawing in blue and the child's drawing in green. And, Here's a, a few other examples. Um, my ambition for this piece, though, is really was was to push on into into more of a real time interactivity and exchange. Um, so I've since added some computer vision to the project to facilitate like a real time interactivity. So so now the the hand what do they call it an eye in hand robot? So the so the arm has an eye, um, so it can it can kind of attend when someone sits down, pay attention to their presence. It can draw, it can look at the drawing, wait for the human to add, and then respond. Um, here, um, so this has been set up as like an interactive experience at SIGGRAPH and Isaiah in the past year. Um, the next step for that is to add kind of a feedback loop to it. So thinking about beyond just having like a turn taking one, two drawing, taking the result and projecting it back into the kind of visual space or visual imagination of the machine learning model. Um, also, in the way that Dennis Oppenheim had these two directions of transfer, like past to present and present to past, um, you know, I'm, I'm working to build this transfer in the other way. So we had from GAN to child, and I wanna go from child to GAN. So um, working with my son's like, semantic textual descriptions of what he's drawn. Like for instance, exercise equipment for a dog. <laughs> or a spider with her eggs. Um, you know, using a contemporary model like Clip or something to guide the generation that's coming out of this machine learning model. So, um, and, and producing results from there. So I think there, there are additional dimensions to explore here of 
kind of relationships between text and image, um, and also engaging both the, the human and the computational system on these different levels of like semantics, sort of image understanding, um, and, and relations between captions, captions and images. But back to this idea of sort of surrogates or, um, you know, uh, surreal inspirations. I think you know this this system is functioning sort of sort of like a surrogate or a collaborative drawing partner um, for the child. So the so the next project is um, was really an explicit exploration of of artificial visual and textual imagination. So working with generative text and text to image translation. Um, this was a project that I um, did with three collaborators for Politics of the Machines in 2021. Um, and the project was, it's called Beyond Classification, The Machinic Sublime. Um, but it was structured as a round table for six human and six non-human intelligences. So each of us was paired, each, each human performer or, or discussant was paired with a non-human partner um, so we had my collaborator Unsu Kang together with her model Viola, which was a text to Viola model trained on her, um, I think her uh, nephew's um, Viola recordings. We had uh, my collaborator uh, Joel Ong with his um, Euglena. So this was like a small microorganism that he was tracking in a Petri dish using computer vision. Um, had some feedback through LED lights um, and was using the movements of those organisms to generate text. And then my piece was really this reflection on kind of, um, was, was a text to image piece where, um, you know, where I'd been working with text prompted from GPT-3 on this idea of the sublime and sort of the terror, you know, the, the sublime in nature and in art is this the terror or the awe that we experience in the encounter with the vastness of nature and kind of the, the terror that that encounter brings. Um, I thought that was a nice analogy to kind of encountering the vast potential, multi-dimensional potential of these generative systems. Um, also produces a sort of an encounter with the sublime. So the contents of the piece um, involved involved prompting the language model on, on these different topics, you know, like write an essay on the following topics to be delivered, blah, blah, blah. Um, this is not, you know, pre-chat chat GPT, more like GPT-3, um, but started with generating text, then selecting kind of key images from that text uh, to generate images, and the thing was delivered as a human me performing this kind of emergent text with this um, you know, visual accompaniment. So this was an experiment with kind of a, a live, a performative AI or live performance. Um, so you can see sort of the, the complicated online setup on the right here with like live prompting, streaming of existing videos, textual reference, and then me sort of working with that as a, as a performer, kind of pulling from that collection of, of images and text. Um, we broke it into this, first this introduction kind of on vastness and this idea of the sublime in nature and in the machine learning, um, and then move from that onto a series of topics. Um, so, sorry, highlighted phrases like the sublime experience of an iceberg were then translated with like a clip plus GAN method into this sort of a visual representation. Um, it was important for me that none of these be kind of like fixed representations that they, that they show that kind of like continuous fluid transformation um, that we get in like the continuous space of a GAN, like big GAN, um, you know, when you're interpolating through latent space. That there's something about, maybe it's for me as a painter, there's something compelling about the plasticity of this image and the sense that something looks sort of photographic, but can change in a continuous way, which is something that we don't really encounter in you know, full motion video or um, or um, other other mediated experiences. So we moved on from this intro section to a series of subtopics. Like this was on plants as potential. Um, these topics were designed as a group to engage with like each of our kind of non-human participants. Um, but everything followed with this kind of 
this approach of like text prompting, then generating kind of illustrative, um, you know, key images out of that text. Um, this was on our relationship with machines. So on the left there we have, or right there we have a, a family of robotic seals. And so in delivery in this first version of this performance, you know, you would be, you'd be kind of like seeing this sort of visual and human voice pairing. Um, I wanted to share this project, you know, you know, these, first off, these techniques are changing so quickly, right? That, um, you know, uh, the image generation and text guided image generation is, is just blowing up in the past year in terms of like new releases of new models every few months. Um, same with, same with kind of the text generation side. Uh, but like my ambition as an artist is to develop some strategies that, that could work um, with existing models, but maybe could keep working with further models that you could like plug in a updated model of text image generation or an updated um, text generation model. So like, like as a researcher sort of exploring what these dynamics are as a individual subjectivity engaging with the possibilities of this model. So this got a little diagrammatic here, um, but I just wanted to show you sort of like how this worked for me. So starting with the prompt, you know, you might run the prompt and get a response and then make some decision about you know, just some subjective decision. Maybe sometimes you don't even have to like articulate what sort of in a subjective way, in a, in a concrete or explicit way, what it is you like or don't like about this model. Maybe it can be kind of an unconscious guidance in the same way that the surrealists might have guided their creations. But starting with a prompt, which you can run ad infinitum, right? You can like feed in this same prompt and get a different result. And if you don't like it, you can regenerate and get another one. And if you don't like it, you can regenerate it and get another one. Um, this is kind of terrifying, right? How do you guide that process? That there's this like vast space of textual output. Um, but the way that the text, sort of the canonical text or performed text for this piece evolved was in this kind of iteration. So like producing responses, responses, then maybe tweaking, tweaking the prompt. So starting with like, this is the essay I wrote aimed at art theorists. Moving on to this is the essay I wrote aimed at philosophers. And like the way, you know, GPT and these other large language models work, is that those like minor differences in kind of um, intonation or inflection, it's text, not speech, but you know, these minor differences in phrasing can play kind of dramatic effects on how the completion is made by the language model. Meaning that I feed in this text and then whatever we're reading is kind of what the language model has added to or completed it with. Um, so this process was really one of iterative prompting um, and then, you know, each of these responses, you know, produces kind of a different possibility and sort of it was this kind of like layered iteration of text production. In turn, <laughs> these text phrases were then, I was looking for sort of like imagistic text, you know, things that were like evocative of some kind of a visual representation or like a photographic or visual imagery. So then I would, I would, I would piece through these um, and select kind of text to seed images with. So these are translations of these texts. Um, th these were made with Big GAN, which was trained on ImageNet. So it's this like collection of a thousand categories of common kind of objects and things and people. And so, so there's a lot to talk about with ImageNet. But um, so, so ImageNet being guided by CLIP, so this kind of text to image model. Um, these were all repeatably random, which is something interesting to me in that they're all seeded. If you wanna, this is useful if you're trying to produce these interpolations later that you have fixed points and you can kind of produce the exact same fixed points and produce these um, transitions between images. Um, this process is really about that encounter with the unknown or surprise, right? That, that I might have an idea of what the sublime experience of an iceberg might look like you probably have a different one, um, and the model definitely has its own, right? In the same way that um, Solipsis, the speech interaction project, recognition project earlier, was supposed to kind of give you some direct experience with like the qualities or the limits of that model, um, this kind of a process also is sort of revelatory about what the model can make, like what its potential is, like what its latent space, its space of possible images is, right? If I tried this same prompt with a different model, it would produce a different result. Um, but so each of these become kind of the parallel 
manifestations of each of these images. I would work through the different scenes in this way. Um, and, then, and then try to navigate this kind of networks of, of scenes, phrases, and transitions. Um, so this, it's a challenge to do this in real time. So like a real time or performative AI, uh, synthesizing images takes time. Um, these were pre-rendered nodes and transitions, which were then, then performed. Um, also, each of these, this like together is kind of a finite subset of a broader field of possible outputs on this same topic. Um, that's a very different idea of what an artwork might be, right? That it's something that you could interrogate or regenerate, see differently, regenerate the text in the image. It would manifest as sort of a totally different piece in some ways, but also retain some of whatever the core, you know, core of the thing is. Um, so this project was really about navigating this kind of vast space of possibility. Um, and I was trying to do it in real time, and this is something that I'm pursuing in current work, but kind of real time generation, real time performance. Um, but what you find really is that human choice is the limiting factor here, right? And the way that I'm doing it, that human decision making is slow compared to the ease with which it, uh, you can generate more text. Um, similarly, as much as there's a preference between these different kind of like phrases to illustrate and you know, which particular representations to use, um, those choices are kind of the costly part of this system. But the, the dynamic of this interaction here is this feeling of, of kind of coaxing or eliciting responses from a model that we're kind of coming as like a supplicant or something, you know, like querying and, and, asking, and asking for results and like changing how you phrase it or how you run it um, until you hone in on something um, that works. The last project that I want to talk about is also in this vein of um, performative AI or creative co-production with these AI systems, but in a, in a kind of a collective way, like multiple humans and multiple interfaces with the machine. So this is a project um, in AI, it's a radio play, so it's called a AI Radio Play. Um, the first two versions of this were done in a workshop format, so over like an eight hour, nine hour workshop. Um, and this, the idea is that this is an introduction for writers, theater makers, creatives to generative text through a hands-on workshop with GPT, but culminating in this live, collectively co-authored radio performance. So um, part of this comes from an interest in the medium of radio and sort of radio experience as being an ideal um, context or medium in which to explore generative text. Uh, you know, people say radio is a very visual medium, right? That, that you, you're not providing anything to the eyes, but it produces this whole world of kind of visual experience in terms of what you hear. Um, this is also about exploring this potential for, you know, collaborative co-authorship with LLMs. So with a large language model where it's sort of humans are writing together, humans are writing together with the language model. Um, and the, the result is some composite of all of those contributions to the process. Um, this started, some of these people might be familiar to the design lab, but um, started with um, Ash Smith, my colleague, Jinku Kim, um, Stephanie Sherman, and Hernan Woodgate. Um, Stephanie and Hernan and Augusta um, have a, a radio project called Radio EE. So they were coming to this from kind of a nomadic radio perspective where they do these 24 hour radio performances. Um, I'm coming at it from this kind of generative text in this interest in, in radio. Um, and we came together in late 2021, 2022 to put together this first workshop for um, Isaiah 2022 in Barcelona. So here you can see our participants. This is, they look happy at the end of a eight hour, nine hour day. So I think that's kind of a miracle. Um, but, you know, within the event, within like an eight hour day, um, these participants created together a narrative through human prompted writing, or let's see, prompting humans, prompting machines, using machines to augment text from humans and machines, and then kind of assembling these pieces into a script, which is then performed and broadcast live. Um, the results were this live broadcast, so, so a 30 minute 
kind of episodic radio show where each episode was centered around kind of a central mystery. Um, this project is, is conceived of as kind of a, a site-specific engagement. So um, where it happens, the idea is to engage with the local context in some way. Um, so it's sort of episodic in that sense that like a news reporter or a show might travel from site to site. Um, and the audience is brought into this piece via headphones. And so they are kind of part of this unfolding live performance. So it's broadcast um, you know, uh, on the internet, but there's also this in-person experience in, in headphone. And actually the whole, the whole writing process, the whole workshop is conducted in, in headphones. <laughs> so in radio space, even kind of introducing you know, the, the concept, the approach, introducing the, the computational tools that we're using to write with. Um, so in terms of process, uh, for this, we started with prompts for human writers, right? Like what ifs, things that you might do in like a freshman writing seminar or something. So, you know, tell us about a mysterious place that occupied your child, or, you know, occupied your childhood. What was an unexplained phenomenon from the area where you grew up? You know, tell us about a weather phenomenon. Um, you know, each of these are intended just to kind of like loosen up the human writers and get them kind of working with text and thinking about text. Um, we moved on from that to um, then introduce this idea of like AI augmentations or elaborations on that text. All this was conducted in Discord, which is nice in that like it's all digital native text. So participants can pull from each other's you know, scenarios, they can respond to them, they can grab that text and use it as part of a prompt for a language model. Um, but so, so starting with prompts for human writers, then kind of AI augmentation and elaboration, like introducing this idea of like augmenting a text or expanding it or building some variant on it using a, a you know, a, a generative AI method. Um, then there's this element of collective decision making, which is like just this group together is, is kind of deciding on some key elements of this project. Um, so this first one was anchored to the site of, of Barcelona, um, but we moved on from kind of writing prompts to, um, to describing like, you know, kind of building in, in stages, building from kind of some like basic aspects of, um, you know, building some, sorry, building some um, kind of basic material to work with, then honing in on kind of elements that we might, might need for dramatic structure like a, you know, mysterious event or something at the center of the piece, and then moving from there into concrete segments like of a radio show and assembling a script. The second version of this um, at SLSA and at Purdue in October um, was again kind of a site-specific piece. So this, this is interesting. Um, this, we were researching West Lafayette, Indiana, where we were conducting this this workshop and the history of kind of radio broadcast in, 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 um, in that area and learned that they had piloted this aerial broadcast platform in the, in the late 60s. So they, they flew a jet in like 800 mile circles over the Midwest with a 30 foot television antenna hanging down and broadcast physics lectures to students in classrooms watching them on televisions. Um, in, in doing this kind of site research and looking into the, into the place, this became sort of the most compelling context or premise um, you know, for the piece. So, so at the start, um, from the moment our participants walked in and put on their headphones, we described this scenario, that you are on board this aerial broadcast platform. Over the next few hours, we're gonna assemble the elements for the show to broadcast to the, to the folks below. Um, in the second version of the piece, we integrated the, the generation into the writing platform. So rather than kind of bouncing out to the GPT playground or something or a different website, um, we just built a Discord bot into Discord so that you could sort of fluidly work between text and, um, and you know, machine generated text. And so, you know, um, you know, you could, you know, directly message the bot or tag the bot in a message and it would take whatever you wrote as like the prompt, which it would then complete. Um, so this, this was, at this point, we were, we were on to the segments for the show. This was a segment called Local Color. So I prompted it for, you know, a short radio segment describing an extremely unusual popular fashion trend in Lafayette, Indiana. 
Um, and this, this trend was wearing live animals as accessories. <laughs> Whether it's a snake wrapped around your neck or a mouse peeking out of your pocket, more and more people are seen sporting furry or scaly friends as the latest must-have accessory. So, okay, so this is all sort of folded into the system and lets you, you know, kind of, you know, quickly try ideas, change a prompt. Um, I think if you, I think if you want to re-prompt, you just edit your thing and send it again. It'll, it'll produce a new one. Um, and then it also allows that kind of collective authorship where I could pull text from other, other contributors. Um, I could pull results from other people's generation and put it, kind of assemble it together. But all of this is funneling towards a, a text which is then, then performed. Um, this project is developed, we're, we're in the works, we're putting together a more of like a stage theatrical production. Um, this, if we jump back to, uh, let's see, I don't want to, Orson Welles, War of the Worlds, this is radio, Mercury Radio Theater on the Air, rehearsing one of their shows, AI reconstruction of that image. Um, we're interested in this as a, as a spectacle, kind of the apparatus of production, the apparatus of broadcast. So we're looking at um, doing this as a stage production where um, some parts of this kind of AI writer's room are happening like in the moment, um, you know, the broadcast is happening and then conceiving of the performance venue as like an extended theater piece, like once in the same way that we had people like walk in and told them they were on this broadcast platform here it's like, um, you know, once they're in the theater, they become part of kind of a, a live action scenario. Um, this is developing in different ways. We're adding some other elements like a live kind of text to image generation when thinking about a um, textual show. And then also beyond kind of this static querying, like writing text and generating text and getting new results, um, have all, I have also been developing some kind of live performance tools for this. So um, the three threads I've been thinking about are kind of this live listener that's just transcribing whatever it's hears. This is like, how many ways can we work with text? <laughs> so this listener is just transcribing whatever it hears. Um, anything you grab here, you can send to a prompt or send it straight to the script. Then there's this central column, it's sort of for, um, for the prompting and this left column, which is this live kind of dynamic script. And this is just like very early, I have kind of a functional prototype, but um, this is this area that I'm developing, which is, which is you know, what, um, beyond this sort of static query and response relationship to a language model, um, so much of that interaction is about, um, it's like improv, it's like a, it's a kind of liveness, like that, that you put something in, something comes out that surprises you, which then forces you to kind of accommodate that and change what you intended to do. Um, we're trying to move that from the space of like writing the text to the space of actual performance. So giving the system a voice where maybe it can speak at certain times during the performance and also um, having, having the text kind of adapt in real time. So. Um, and this, this is this example of, of um, you know, working for kind of like how could you have a visual setting that tracks with the contents of a performance in real time? So one way to do that is like really downsampling your, your generation so that it can happen faster um, and try to produce some sort of like a visual context on stage, like projections that, um, that track with the contents of a piece but um, are happening in real time. So, um, so these projects that I showed you, you know, explore some different ways of working with um, kind of interactions between human and creative AI. Um, you know, so this, the, the, the three-stage drawing transfer, that first one is really this embodied interaction between a human and an AI. So this explicit juxtaposition of like a human and machine creativity occurring in the space of drawing. They're both kind of co-equal participants, right? That they're both contributing in the same manner to this drawing that's produced. Um, the, second, the second performance, that Politics of the Machines, that um, human and non-human panel, was really more about this kind of mediumistic channeling of latent possibilities. So, um, you know, querying and kind of iterating on that until you sort of elicit a response that fits, fits the vision of the moment. Um, 
and working with those kind of those vast spaces of these text and image generation networks. And that's really intended to be sort of performed and navigated in real time. And then that last piece, the radio play, is really about collective co-authorship and live performance. And so extending it beyond the kind of one-to-one -one relationship between a human and a generative model um, in thinking about the ways that we as humans can collectively co-author stories, you know, maybe almost in like an oral storytelling tradition um, and, and perform those in ways that these computational tools can augment or add or contribute to that scenario. Um, so all of these in different ways are kind of exploring some complex interactions between language, cognition, and creativity. Um, you know, the question for me is, is really like, where do we anchor authorship in this? You know, is it, is it always human in the loop? Is the human always driving the situation? Can we ever say that, you know, the system is initiating or the system is driving it? Um, or maybe we have these strange loops of like push and pull between kind of machine intent, machine resistance, human intent, human production. Um, and I'll just leave with the questions that still motivate me. I mean, you know, what, what is it like, you know, is, is it a search for novelty that we, you know, that we find stimulating about interacting with these systems? Um, at lunch, we were talking about novelty and too much novelty becomes noise, right? Um, so there's limits to that, but you know, you know, what's appealing about this desire to like escape or transcend, you know, your kind of individual subjectivity or creative approach? Um, even you know, early image generation techniques like uh, deep dream, you know, these things are like analogized to human imagination, human dreams. Um, you know, so so you know, why is it that we're asking for this from from these systems? Um, and can these systems have, you know, you know, true agency, or are they just like a longer stick to paint with? You know, a really complicated, technologically, computationally intensive, longer stick to paint with. Um, and and what gets me really is this kind of back to that grandmother piece is, you know, what is this? Where does this feeling of like connection or communion or being heard or being seen? come from when we know that these systems that we're working with are these kind of merely technological or mechanical implementations. Um, so I'll leave it there, uh, and I would love to answer some questions. So it's very interesting. I, I love like hearing kind of you know, your process, your creative process, your community with AI um, as part of your process. And I'm wondering how you think about um, your sort of interaction with your audience, like who's who's inevitably like interacting with your pieces, and and, and the sort of drawing co-drawing experience, you're directly interacting with the AI, the, the the you know the user, so to speak, is also creating and is part of that process. Whereas some of it, like the radio show, it's all behind the scenes where the AI, AI is sort of contributing to the creativity. Um, and then, you know, at home, radio listener is just kind of receiving yeah. the, the experience. So how do you think about your, you know, positioning, um, you know, the, the AI and that, you know, creating the community experience for the, for the audience um, versus just using it as part of your creative process? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I don't, I, don't think, I don't think the same approach suits every project, you know, so it's so a different, different times kind of call for different things. Um, I do think, I think there's, I think there's value, like I was saying with those like pre-generative projects at the beginning, there's value in kind of a direct experiential encounter with these, um, these technological systems. So I do think, um, you know, the, the robot is kind of theatrical and you're seeing like this image distilled through a robot, so it has a lot of spectacle involved. Um, but in a in a in the same vein, I think there's like you know there's value in having this like direct experiential encounter where you are like a free agent interacting with someone and you see kind of like what responses that produces. And I think that's actually one thing that the arts are really good for as far as like kind of being an experiential interface to technologies or way about thinking think about them through doing. I also think there is value in like demonstration cases or something, and the um, you know the the that text image piece, which just looks pretty rough and a little old, but you know, it's it, there's um, 
there's something about like through repetition or through variety, just like even just presented as like fixed media that we're just seeing like clips of video and hearing a text that that, that can still communicate something about like scale, like scale of possibility or things like that, you know, scale of like what a system, uh, you know, generative system could produce. Um, yeah, so I, don't, I think um, I think both kinds of experiences like have their qualities um, and and value, and I think um, yeah. It's, I mean, I started you know part of what I like about these image generation things is their like painterly qualities, and I, I started as a visual artist in painting that's really like not so interactive, right? You're producing like static images that you like contemplate as you know objects of detached contemplation, um, and so. Yeah, so I think sometimes that works and not everything has to be an interactive experience, but in both have qualities. Yeah.